I love that song, but that's not how it was written. We are a by the book people, y'all, right? And that wasn't, but no, I'm just kidding. I love that song, and I, I love it when Michael leads. He's, I'm glad Michael is here. I am one grateful preacher to have a youth minister like Michael and what he's doing with the young people, and look forward to this summer and what they're doing. Also grateful for Charlotte and what she's doing. She's one amazing uh, children's coordinator and, and just uh, has a heart and a passion for it. I spent some time uh, on the phone with Jonathan today as we were kind of updating some different things about what's going on with him. He's just doing outstanding work as surprises no one. Um, he's faced challenges and when he does, he faces them with integrity just the way scripture would have him do. But he has, um, he's always had this desire for an evangelistic effort and so they've started something, a small group on Sunday nights, certain Sunday nights of the month. Uh, and, and it's a it's a big undertaking and they've, they've trusted him to make some changes like that and do some different things. And I told him, I said, I am so proud of that and I'm going to mention that to the, the Valley View people and for all of us to be praying for this effort that they're making where he's at. So if you would, if, if, if you're in your prayers this week, if you would mention Jonathan, I know that you do, but in particular the church as it strives to, to reach its community with these small group efforts that he's making. I love the idea and I said I'm going to be calling you, asking you for advice here pretty soon if this works out for you and, and, and I just know it will. God's blessing him in big ways but proud of him and, and grateful our paths have crossed. We are in Exodus chapter 23 beginning verse 20. Uh, you, you heard the reading very well done. You heard all the ites, the Hittites and the parasites and all these other people that are in Canaan. Um, and it's a difficult reading and it's a weird kind of reading because it doesn't seem to fit. Uh, are you ready for your test this week? Are you ready? Because it's going to happen. It may not be this week, but it's going to be soon. For some it is. We know from Scripture it's true that God tests His people. The language used about uh, Abraham when it came to offering his son Isaac on the altar is clearly test language. And that wasn't an aberration. That wasn't an unusual um, move of God. It is a usual thing for him to test his people. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, I think it's on the screen, and this is what he says about the wilderness years. This is after they're over, as they're about to go in the promised land, Moses says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you. And he's 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. You know what God was doing during that time? You know what God was doing every time he kept them away from food for a while? He was testing them. Do these people trust me or not? And so God says a big part of our Christian experience is going to be this. Do you really believe the words that I say or not? Now you can just sit around and talk about them in sermons and you can memorize them sometimes. And you have Bible classes about my, my source of authority I've given you in your scriptures. But do you really believe them in your life or not? You're going to have chances to think about that. This lesson was put together in the wake of Randy Simpkins revealing his cancer diagnosis. Some things have been maybe cleared up since then. But I was thinking about him, and I was, uh, you, always, you always do this. You think about worst-case scenarios, and I'm thinking about Randy and how important he is to so many people in this church uh, in, in total. And it was overwhelming, and it was an emotional reaction just thinking about what is going on with him and what's going to happen, and nobody really knows. I had a feeling of anger, I had a feeling of frustration and concern. It's, it's not that I wondered if God cared about him or if his faith was strong enough. It's not that. I thought about the inconvenience this was going to bring into his life and to his family's life, what this could possibly do. And it's kind of an overwhelming feeling of paralysis, sort of. I, I should have thought about a few other truths, and I did. Um, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. You get a diagnosis like that. It's not the first response, James 1. Pure joy. Love it. Right? Or, or all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Thought about that, but I began to think, okay, but this is really going to be touchy, right? Because it's not just a test for him. It's his family. His family's going to have to go through this together. It's, a, it's the church, too, going through this, too. And I got to thinking about this as a test. 
And that's when our text of Exodus chapter 23 hits me, and it's almost going to seem like maybe I'm trying to force this into Exodus, but not really. Here's the question God wants in this passage. Are you really going to believe me or not? Are you really going to believe the things I say, or is this all a bunch of wishful thinking? Is this all like a little pep talk we give each other to make life a little better? Is religion the opiate of the people to make us feel like it gives us a little control of life? Is that all it is, or do we really believe this? And when the time comes, am I going to stand on those truths and trust that it's underwritten by an eternal hand of God that's powerful enough to sustain everything He says and promises? Do I really believe that? You don't ever really know until the time comes. You don't know. You'd like to think so. And things are fine, you know, and you can start just kind of thinking good things about faith until life throws you a curve. When life is light, it's kind of easy to believe. When life gets heavy and you have to put all your weight down on what you believe and you can't really see anything at all, you know, at school, a test demonstrates, did you get the information or not? For God, a test demonstrates, do you really believe the things you've read and you've heard about God or not? Israel discovered this. They knew about the promise to Abraham. It's something they've talked about endlessly. It's ages old by the time you get to Exodus already. It's some, it's some 400, 500 years old by then. But it was everything to them. It was why they thought themselves special. It was the assurance of a future. It was their very identity. But specifically, God told Abraham, I'm going to send you guys, your people, your offspring down to Egypt. I'm going to bring them out in numerical glory while they're there, right? And I'm going to come and I'm going to bring you then to the land you're standing on, Abraham. It's going to happen. And he repeated this and he wanted it repeated over and over and over like the chorus of a song you cannot get out of your head. You ever heard of an earworm? We are headed to uh, Perry Wood's funeral and I knew one of the songs that they were going to play was... Uh, Guns and Roses. You know that knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. You know this one? It sounded better than that, but I was doing that all the way to Monette because I, I kind of like that song, and it's one of Perry's favorites. So they're going to they're gonna play that at the funeral. I just kept singing that, and Melissa said, I, I used to like that song. <laughs> Quit singing it, but it, got in, it gets in your head, and it just goes around and around, and, and you can't get it out. It's, and God did that on purpose with the promise to Abraham. You're going to go through some dark times. You're going to go through 400 years of wilderness, not wilderness wonder, but slavery in Egypt. You're going to go through a long stretch where you begin to wonder, and I want that earworm in your head. I want that promise ringing in your head constantly so that when I call you to act on it, it won't be unfamiliar. It won't be odd. It won't be foreign. It won't be strange. It resonates with you because there's a song in your head about it. And now they're at Sinai, Exodus chapter 23. He's given the Ten Commandments and other various commandments we talked about. And then there's this weird section tonight that doesn't seem to fit. And in fact, you could go from chapter 23, verse 19, straight to chapter 24, where they redo the covenant. You could do that without a hitch. There's nothing in here that, that seems to fit. But in the middle of it, he says, but let me tell you what I'm about to do. I'm going to take you to this land, right? I'm going to take you here. Exodus, even when he called Moses in Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to take you to that land. He calls Moses, he says, let me tell you, I'm about, I'm a, I've heard it. I've heard the misery and it's time. That time I told what Moses, Abraham about and that time that I've told you that chorus is about, now I'm going to strike a chord. I want you to go and I want you to tell the elders, now's the time for the song to be actualized. And so when he goes to the, to the elders and tells them, it's not a strange thing to him. It's not like, who are you and what are you doing here? No, when he hits that chorus, there's a land waiting for you and I'm ready to give it to you. The people says, we're ready to follow because this song has been playing for 400 years in the Jewish mind because God intends it to be something they never forget and when, it, when he's ready to move on it they're ready to listen and so when Moses goes 
They're ready to listen. Now they're at the Ten Commandments. They get the Ten Commandments and he, and he gets, says it again. He says, this big long section, I'm about to take you to this land. I'm, I'm ready to lead you. And this section is amazing. It says, first of all, I'm going to send an angel. I'm going to make sure this angel can lead you there. And if you obey the voice of God, if you do everything this angel does, and it says, I'm going to make your enemies my enemies. You are on my side. I got you covered, he says. I'm going to blot out all the enemies of the promised land. Now, here's the funny thing. They're going to go in and take the promised land, but it's very obvious that they don't have to do a whole lot. God's the one who's doing the fighting. Now, we could go into Joshua about this, or maybe I could just tell you, come to VBS in two weeks because that's what VBS is about. Joshua taking the promised land. But there's no question, right? When you go to Jericho and you play the movie of the Battle of Jericho, it's pretty clear these people aren't really doing the fighting, right? It's pretty clear. When you see everything that happens, there's some other factor involved in this war because they are not impressive fighters. They march around 13 times, blow the trumpets, the walls fall in, they go and they take the people. There's just some other hand here, right? And that's what he says, I'm sending my hornet before you. Y'all ever been stung by a hornet before? God says, you know how I'm going to do this? Before you ever go start fighting, before you take up your weapons and you fight these people, I've got a whole swarm of hornets that's going to scare the living daylights out of them so you don't really have to fight much. I remember a few years ago, this is one of those shameful things on a bus that kids witness. The whole group, a youth group from Slicer Street was delivering meals on a Tuesday morning. And there's this lady, I deliver, I deliver the meals every Tuesday, but I got the youth group to help sometimes. And there's this old, old woman living in this trailer. So I'd go and I'd deliver the meals. But this particular time, I had a young person with me. So we walk in there. And as I'm walking in there, I'm starting to be chased by bumblebees. Hornets are bad. Bumblebees are the things that terrify me at night. They keep me up at night just thinking about them. They don't need a reason. They just need to look at you. It's all they need. And I would not come out of that trailer until that bumblebee left. This woman was hooked up on oxygen. She couldn't walk. She couldn't do anything. She was feeble and frail. And she says, what's your hang up? I said, there's bumblebees out there and I'm terrified. Well, they won't hurt you. I said, oh yeah, they will. And I, hear, I said, I've heard that all my life. And it's a lie. It's a lie people tell you to not be afraid of them. Oh, don't worry. She gets herself up out of her recliner. Kids looking at the bus, looking in at this. And this old woman comes out there with oxygen hanging over here. And a walker. And she starts going... Clearing the way for the young preacher to go through the swarm of bumblebees. And the young people, I get back to the bus and they said, what was that? I said, she protected us from the bumblebees. And they said, you should be ashamed of yourself. That's true, but bumblebees scare me. What God says was this. Before you ever take up arms and before you ever fight these people, I've got a force, I've got a force out there that's fighting them for you. I'm going to tell you, they didn't have to fight much. These people had this promise that God was already fighting before they ever took up arms. And then it says, he gives a description, the boundaries of Canaan. These people didn't know geography. They'd never been in the promised land. He said, it's going to start here and it's going to go down down here. And he gives them a color map of the land that's going to be theirs, the deeds in their hand. And he gives them the names of the rivers and the names of the boundaries. It's that promised land map in the back of your map, in the back of your Bible. God says, I want you to know I'm going to give it to you already. But just whatever you do, don't bow down to their gods. That was always a temptation. Whatever you do, listen to me. Do not bow down to their gods. I'll give you the land. I'll give you every bit of it. And I'll fight for it for you. I will be the one taking care of this. Just follow my will. God ordained this a long time ago. He gave it to Abraham. It was the earworm in their head. Kept resonant and it kept going. It was the, the way they got Moses to go into Egypt and get them out. And it's at the Mount Sinai. And now he's telling them yet again. Once again, here's the chorus playing again. I want you to remember this. Now you're going to say, why are you stressing this so much? Because when it came time to actually do it, they screwed it all up. After all this time of believing the promise and hearing it in their head and, and saying it every Saturday and telling their kids about it, being taught about it and then teaching their kids and after talking about it and having sermons about it and Bible classes about it, when it came time to live it, they vacated. 
There comes a time we either believe it or you walk away from it. No more playing games with this stuff. And I'm sitting there looking at Randy Simpkins going, well, do you believe this? And he does. This is the time to decide, is this all a game or is this real? Am I going to stand on it with my life? Are you? It's real easy to say until the diagnosis is yours. In numbers, they finally start moving. After a year at Sinai, they finally start moving. It takes, according to Deuteronomy, 11 days to go from Sinai to the Promised Land. It took them about two months, which is reasonable when you've got a couple of million people with you. But here they are at the cusp of it. In the book of Numbers, and God says, there it is, go get it. And they say, well, let's first of all send out spies. Why? Why would you need to send out spies? What would be the point of that? Now, God gives them permission, but it's the people's suggestion that they go in and send out spies. And the question is, why would you do that? If it's yours, you've got the deed, God's got the promise, the hornets are flying out there, the angel's leading you, why do you even need to go scope it out? What's the point of that? Because as soon as they come back with a report, the people decide we're not going to do it. We can't do it. They're too big. The land's too big. We're not powerful enough. So forget it. All this scripture they've been taught, this promise they'd been hear hearing all their lives, this course going through their head of the promise of Abraham of this land, this sa every Sabbath, every time they got together, they reminded themselves there's a promise and that there for it. And they get here and they just can't trust it. And it makes you wonder. Do we believe all the stuff we say? Are we just talking? You can only know when the test comes. And as a church, we have people living out the test in front of us. We become part of their support network. But you've got people like Phil right now who's so used to that beautiful, wonderful wife of his being faithful. And now he's trying to figure out what his life look like without her. And not a minute, he was telling me the other day, not a minute goes by. It's off his mind. It's test time. We all know God's trustworthy, that we can lean on Him when we need Him, that He'll be there and He'll provide whatever it takes to sustain us. And that's really easy to say in the light. But when the dark comes, when the lights go out, are you really going to trust it? And that's where Phil is. He's in test time. That's where Donna is. A strong, vibrant husband of hers is gone. What's life to look like? That's where Randy is. His life is going to change one way or another in big time. question is, what is he going to do? Now, here's the material God gave him. You obey me, follow my word, submit to my will. I will bless you. I will be on your side. I will fight for you. I will sustain you. Your enemies will be my enemies. Your adversaries, my adversaries. Just whatever you do, don't turn to some other God when the trouble comes. Don't, don't bail on me and trust something else when the time comes. Don't change your mind and don't suddenly switch to another solution when the trouble comes. Trust me. Trust me even when you can't see my hand at the time. So what's it going to look like for you in marriage? It's when you aren't particularly getting along with each other. And it would easy, be a whole lot easier, at least you think, if you'd bow out and go it alone or trade him in for a new model, but you don't. You don't because you trust God's faithfulness. I'm going to be obedient to him, come what may, and he's going to come through for me with something. It's in, youth, in youth, it's when everyone else is living by a different set of standards of what's fun and what's exciting and what's alluring in the world. And everybody wants to go along with that right. But you muster the courage to instead live by God's definition of faithfulness. It's in stress. When everyone else turns to drugs and drinks and sexual distractions and raunchy entertainment and choices that you make to enjoy even a moment of reprieve from the loneliness and the stress and the emotional strain of life. Instead, you hold out and decide that doing what is right and turning to God for real is what you'll do and you'll turn to prayer and fellowship for encouragement as the true solution test times aren't scheduled 
You're not going to go out and find the door of the church building with your test schedule for this week. Well, yours is coming Thursday at 3. It's not happening. God's more like a pop test giver. He's not going to give you an announcement or mail a postcard the day before it happens. Your test is going to come. He promises that. You have the study guide in front of you, and we study it every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night. You hear from it every Wednesday night, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and you know the material. You know what it says. You know what it says. You know the doctrine that's there. But the time when it comes, will you really live it? Or are these just words that you say intellectually before going your own way? Don't answer that. Because the answer is not in what you say. The answer is, what do you do when test comes? Tests are coming for some of us this week. Are you ready? You really believe this stuff? You really believe what you've sung today? You really will believe what's in here? When the time comes, you'll stand on this instead of the easy solutions that aren't solutions at all? Time will tell. I just hate it when people get to the cusp of the promised land and don't trust enough to go in. How crazy is that? Don't be among those, the Hebrew writer says, Hebrews writer says, who shrink back. You know the truth question is, will you do it? This evening, if you need strength, if you need prayers, you need encouragement from the church, if you need to respond to the truth because you've never responded to it before, we're ready to receive you. But the real question is this. When the test comes, what are you going to do? Whatever response you need to make, make it now as we stand and sing. On bended knee.